Well, can I have I, a yes/no paddle on this? I'm kidding. I hate the yes, no <laughs> bullshit. I, I just really want everyone out there, if you're a Boulder voter, if anyone ever says yes or no on anything and doesn't add any Some kind nuance, of yeah. nuance or context or, or thoughtfulness around it, never vote for them. Nobody can tell me about neighborhood character. Like I grew up here. So the people saying, oh, if you have too much density for affordable housing, you're changing the neighborhood character. I'd be like, no, I'm, where do you live? Oh, you live in a, and again, this isn't going to make me a lot of friends, but you live in a McMansion on North Boulder Park that was built in the last 15 years. It's millions of dollars. You change the neighborhood character. My dream would be to do something on the absentee landlords and the property management companies because they have no investment in this community. We ain't throwing starfish here, now we're having a good party. Talking about structural change. We believe the land is sacred, even beneath that vacant parking lot. But the weeds are doing their best to express the need for something different. Gonna make some space. residential pedestrian district where I can gracefully grow older. I'm gonna spend my remaining years sharing Boulder. Hello Boulder and the wider world. This is the Sharing Boulder podcast. My name is Philip Ogren and for episode 37 I spoke with Waylon Lewis who is a Boulder resident that is running for city council this fall. We met at Columbia Cemetery on the hill and talked about a wide variety of subjects including West Pearl, fire mitigation, biking in Paris, white metal roofs, homelessness, affordable housing, and occupancy, among others. I admire Waylon for his unflinching, tell-it-like-it-is approach to engaging in candid dialogue that is filled with empathy and good humor. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Waylon Lewis. Waylon, uh, welcome to Sharing Boulder. Thank you so much for uh, making time today to sit, sit in the, uh, the cemetery with me here and, uh, and be on the podcast. Appreciate it. So I live near here. This is where I've, you know, come probably zero to 15 times a day for okay. 16 years now uh, with my dogs. And uh, yeah, it's a bucolic spot. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we didn't do this at 3 a.m., uh, but three, you know, uh, middle yeah. of the night. Yeah, <laughs> and hopefully the sprinklers won't turn on halfway through, although that okay. would make good for good uh, television. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Thanks please, for having me. Yeah, you bet. Please uh, introduce yourself and yeah. uh, and tell us about you're running for city council or you're, you're planning to. So yep. uh, yeah, tell us about that. Yeah, the campaign begins on August eighth at three thirty for me. Okay. That's when my signing ceremony is, and um, until then, I'm planning on running, um, and I am planning on running. I've been meeting with people nonstop for I don't know three or four months now, wow. and it's been heaven. Honestly, it's been probably I don't anticipate that feeling of heaven to continue but it's been such a pleasure just to meet with you know everyone's sort of on their best in their best self mode usually one on one yeah. they don't they're not speaking to a crowd they're not speaking for likes on x or whatever the heck it's called um, yeah. you don't cancel somebody in a one on one conversation <laughs> necessarily and they tend to like even if they have very extreme points of view which a lot of our fellow citizens do on various issues um they convey them with personal passion instead of just kind of partisan sort of fixated mind well, so it's been fun um i grew up here yeah. in boulder i was born here i was born at the hospital we just demolished for hopefully you know i mean we kind of know how that one went but for a significant amount of affordable housing and um you know hopefully a mix that uh makes it a lovely place to go to holiday is probably my favorite neighborhood we've created lately yeah for those on podcasts uh i'm putting that in bunny ear quotes uh-huh um <laughs> you know where it's vaguely affordable there's some affordable housing elderly housing co-housing i was there visiting my friend ryan van duzer the other day and he had just bought his home his like dream house you know and it's still it's not affordable up there but it's it was a small enough 
building that he could buy his own standalone house with a garage for his 36 bikes, you know. Um, and my bike uh, dog cart in the back of wheel fell off. And within one minute, I swear to God, there were like five neighbors out there, including with a toolkit. And that's what we want. We want like kindness and neighbor, you know, resiliency for tough times like pandemics or, you know, crazy elections. Or, or, or uh, flat tires or whatever. Yeah. I mean, daily life. Yeah. That's the blue zone thing, you know, organic, kind community. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I care about every issue. I think you should and you kind of have to if you yeah. want to serve on, on city council. You can't, I guess you can focus on issues and that's healthy, but you need to care. Yeah. Um, and I feel like our city is, in some cases, through no fault of its own. There's larger forces at play that have also hit other cities and towns. But we're having a rough time. I don't think we've had a lot of W's in the last 10 or 15 years. You know, yeah, I think yeah. this is the first time where I felt like I can run time wise, energy wise. You know, I started Elephant Journal here. It became a very big website, independent website around mindfulness and all kinds of issues again. You know, abortion rights and smoothie recipes and, you know, activism and family and biking and everything all over the map that, that's your main career yeah. thing is 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 launching that and um getting that up getting that up and going yeah i mean that thing it. got yeah. really big uh we yeah. have more than 30 million readers at a certain point we've declined precipitously along with a lot of media because mm -hmm. of the facebook algorithm facebook now meta bought its biggest competitor instagram where there's almost no links so social media has become all about itself instead of as a kind of a clearinghouse a or, conduit, a, yeah. or a commons for uh, journalism and media and community. But yeah, then no, that's been really fun and successful in my way to sort of contribute, you know, and we've always been mission driven. We never sold out to the man. We had a lot of offers and, but with the decline of Elephant, um, I'm still going to be running it full time. Uh, still have a great staff, but we had a rough year last year, laid off 20 people. I went from like, Ouch. yeah, people had worked for me for eight, 10 years. It was, talk about losing, it was painful, but we did it with transparency. We did it with kindness as much as we could and and didn't have, I don't think we had much bad blood, if any. And um, at the end of that, I went from like four meetings a day, historically last seven years to like one meeting a week. So suddenly I was like, wow, I have a like, spacious let's run for city council <laughs> life how could i ruin it yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know by serving the city i adore and has given me so much including made elephant happen you yeah. know the community naturally boulder all that i won entrepreneur of the year along with some others in 2007 at naturally boulder to give you an idea like it's yeah. been cool i go way back so we started in 2002 2007 is the year I moved into town and uh, nice. started, welcome yeah. belatedly. <laughs> um, I appreciate you mentioning your, the meetings with so many people and how that's encouraging to you. Like I, um, yeah. I take a lot of um, motivation from the fact that there are so many people in this town thinking critically about how to solve our big problems and ca really caring and engaging and reading and you know like. Um, I don't know if they're thinking about how to solve the big problems, <laughs> well, but they're I, I thinking mean, about how to make Boulder what they want it to be. Sure. And I think one of the reasons I'm running, and I don't mean to interject too much. Yeah, that, no, you, it's your interview. <laughs> is I don't actually find that many people focused on solutions. Okay. I think people are focused on what they want their Boulder to be. It's become very territorial. Interesting. And a lot of like, I think toxicity is sort of over a word that's too easily used. Yeah. Uh, like a lot of name calling, it's used too casually. But I do think there's a fair amount of rigid, fixated opposition in this town. Yeah. And if you pull back like, you know, 20,000 feet, let alone two yards, you'd be like, okay, everyone here is hopefully, you know, maybe not voting for Trump or fascism. Hopefully yeah. we regard climate crisis as real, equal rights, if not equity, as fundamental. Yeah. Like, do we really have to hate each other? Right. There are right. people who will not talk to each other in Boulder. Yeah, over issues around land use, I suppose. Over or, like or, West Pearl. Yeah, right. Being a parking lot or being a, 
a vibrant town square as I would <laughs> yeah. as I was put as yeah. I would put yeah. that yeah. choice. Yeah, you uh, you really didn't uh, lay your card on the table there, uh, describing. No, that. but I mean, yeah. Dave Query is a friend of mine. I met with him like a week or two ago, and he hated me on that issue. And I, I didn't hate him on that issue. I wanted to triangulate and try to make him and others happy. He's a stakeholder. We want vibrant restaurants and retail and local shops. We yeah. don't want Amazon to own Boulder. Yeah, right. With Whole Foods and trucks leeching every neighborhood as I view them. Yeah, my, my view of West Pearl is, um, yeah, a couple extra blocks, that would be great, but I'd love a square mile of resident, of a of pedestrian district uh, downtown, you know? <laughs> uh, Conversation over. <laughs> Done. Yeah, Side. Dave and a lot of people are like, dude, it's two blocks. What are you obsessed about? And you're like, it's the symbolic heart of Boulder. Yeah. Go to Florence, go to wherever. Yeah. Any like. Why can't we have nice things, right? Any yeah. city developed pre cars and the town square is fundamental. The mall is packed. I know there's issues with it, but it is packed. It, yeah. on, I mean, it is well used. And it's a really energetic, motivating place. You go there and you feel better and you see people, you, you, you like have conversations. I mean, I don't know what your experience is on the mall, but I show up there and like, I start talking to people, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, uh, For a hundred years, I was like, I never was in the mall as much you, as you would think if you know me. I, a lot of people call me mayor of Boulder in a casual way and I would always say yeah it's the ideal kind of mayorship where I don't actually do any work whatsoever I just know everyone. <laughs> but I'm on Pearl Street all the time but I would never go on the mall because they ban dogs and they ban bikes and I'm uh, always yeah. with one or, or, one or both. Other, yeah, both. But over the last years um, you know obviously through the years you spend time on the mall and last since the pandemic, for whatever reason, they stopped enforcing dogs. So now I'm there all the time. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, and he's never gone to the bathroom once on the mall. Nice work. Yeah. Winnie. I mean, um, on the mall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, maybe let's, um, let's talk about some of the things you kind of care about most. Uh, what's kind of buzzing around in your brain today? Uh, um, why you're running for city council? Um, I, my favorite thing to do is talk about housing, but we can talk about whatever um, is of interest to you. Well, um, there's like problems that I think need addressing that are urgent. Yep. And there's also opportunities and fun stuff, yeah. which I feel like people forget to talk about because yeah. you always focus on the itch or the, the scratch or the cut on the corporeal body of a community instead of saying appreciating stuff. Like I was just playing with my dog and some other puppies at Scott Carpenter and with like four other young people I've seen there before. And I was like, hey, you know, I'm kind of getting into city council mode. And I was like, hey, you guys live here, you know, you rent, what's your experience? What do you love? What do you not love? And they had nothing they didn't love. They were like, Boulder is heaven. It's really amazing. These were yeah. young people. And as we kept talking, they said, okay, there's, you know, rent is high, but we knew it was gonna be high. And they live in the new sort of transit village area okay. near Zeal, basically. Not on the, the north side of Pearl, on the south side. Okay. But, you know, near like the spot, climbing gym. And, right, right. And then they said, and the lack of diversity. And, and we talked about, you know, I grew up here, half my friends were Latino in, in school, where it was less siloed, at least at mm -hmm. the time, at KC particularly. And um, I said, yeah, you know, we definitely are not diverse. It's like 88% white, which does include Jewish. And as a half Jew, I don't always love Jews being lumped in with white because that's a complex topic and a rabbit hole. But, you know, we have passing privilege, but certainly anti-Semitism is alive and well, or not well in the US. Yeah, right. So, but the Latino community is incredibly strong and a huge part of our community. We're just so siloed. Um, because of issues around, you know, culture, which is wonderful and understandable, and class or affordability or transportation or housing. Yeah. So, yeah, housing is, is a huge one. I'm happy to talk about that. I'd m More likely I'd want to listen to you about it because <laughs> I'm learning, yeah. but... Um, well, um, let's, please. I, I love the, the notion of talking about um, what, what we love about Boulder yeah. and, like, the vision for what it could be. Yeah. Um, you know, we uh, you just brushed on. We just we just touched on the notion of uh, what, what what it would take to, to be a world class city. Um, I I spoke with uh, Bob Yates on a on a recent episode, and 
he had just come back from Budapest, which yeah. has a um, UNESCO World Heritage Site there down yeah. in the in the middle, the, the city center. How could we? How could we have that? You know, I want to. I want to live near a world uh, a world heritage site where yeah. we have really cool density and uh, like you know really um, a vibrant, interactive, you know, uh, walkable blocks districts you know um. i think this is what we need to talk about more is not just the problems which are vital to yeah. get to solutions but um what do we want to be and you know can we actually address these problems so that people can actually wake up in boulder and be like you know what i feel so privileged to be here and yet it's accessible enough to just about everyone yeah and even for those who don't want to live here or or can't there's um, clean, dependable, regular transportation. Yeah. Um, cause you know, some people are going to like 99% of my friends want to move to Lyons or Longmont right now. And we've done, we've done a lot on affordability compared to Colorado Springs and Fort Collins and Denver. And I don't think people acknowledge that or know yeah. that we're at like 8.5% affordability. You may mm -hmm. know better than me. Yeah. And those cities are all less than 1%, I believe. Is that correct? Well, um, yeah, I mean, th this, this notion of affordability has to do with whether it's designated or not. So I would, I, would, I would expect that Colorado Springs has a lot of market rate affordability that we don't have. Yeah, uh, I but, think but, I am but talking then, about designated. Yeah, but, so, but yeah, actually. Because as you know, market rate is market rate. So it's nice yeah. as long as you got it. You right. know, yeah. I bought my house with $500 in my account, no family money. Amazing. Um, in... 2007 or 8 when they were giving loans away it was part of the problem it was part of the housing you bubble. were like a ninja well i was like i need to buy now because brad felt or whoever had moved to town and i was like i'm not gonna be able to buy a home in this town and they were giving loans away i literally applied for a condo loan and they were like you can have up to 1.2 million and i was like why i have 500 dollars <laughs> in my account uh, yeah, they had a they had a mortgage that was called uh, one of the nicknames for it was Ninja because no oh. income. Um, oh, well, no, I no think I probably had no, that. no income, no job, something oh, like that. <laughs> I had a job. Yeah, but. but I was like, you know, a big mortgage will be awful, but I'll rent out some rooms and I'll, you know, my friend yeah. Mark, neighbor Mark is what we all call him. He rented out three rooms. This is like pre Airbnb, and he just made it work. And you hustle, and and that's what I did. Yeah, and I did go into foreclosure three years in, and I got out. You know, I went in that 11th month process and I didn't quite get to 12 months, Ouch. but there were sticking stickers on my front door and taking photos of it. And it was depressing. Yeah, that didn't feel good. It was stressful. It's I felt like stressful. a squatter <sighs> and, and I basically was. And then anyway, uh, I don't know where we were at, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do. Th so the fun stuff, I think, you know, up near where my mom lives, there's a town called Lunenburg, which is also UNESCO. Your mom lives in Europe? In Halifax. Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia, yeah. Canada. Okay. Yeah. So they, for whatever reason, have UNESCO okay. towns. Cool. One is Lunenburg. And they, guess what problem they have? Affordability. And guess yeah. what problem they have? They have people who are in wild opposition to development, which could be defensible or could not be defensible, yeah. depending on what yeah. they're building. You know, which may or may not include affordability, dedicated affordability. Yeah, that's, so, a, good, that's a good point, because you could, you could make this city... Um, you know, three times as dense and, and uh, uh, you know, more beautiful downtown and residential pedestrian district and all this kind of sort of thing. And uh, it could it could potentially be more expensive at that point. I think there's like a hard truth, which I've heard and I don't. I don't capitulate to, yeah. but I think people need to hear it, which is something I heard like five years ago from a trusted friend who I won't out on this conversation. <laughs> but he or she is in politics in public service. And he or she said, we've lost, like affordability is over. Can we improve stuff? Can we, you know, when around the edges, should we give up? Yes, we can make some improvements. No, we shouldn't give up, but it's, that ship has sailed. And I think, I don't know of, I mean, I welcome emails, um, Waylon at waylonlewis.com, but I don't know of a city that has reversed a lack of affordability. There are examples where they've done some good stuff and we can learn from that. And that's one of my visions for, for serving is look at where 
other cities have failed. Look at where they've succeeded. And well, I would, I would push back. I would push back that on I, that in I the following way. I hope to way. God you'll yeah. push back. Because, <laughs> because I, I, what the, the thing, the thing that I would say is that there is no path to affordability in the city limits that goes through single-family homes, right? Like, like there, you'd have to have a complete collapse in demand, and in, in housing for for single-family homes to, to to tank. You know, for the values to drop enough for. And then, of course, at that point, it, the economies in free fall, it, they'd probably still be unaffordable anyways. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think um, the, the model of having a car-dependent city where we have huge tracts of our residential areas uh, dedicated to single-family zoning is, yeah. is there's, there's no path to affordability it, with that kind of... So what is the path? Well, so I, I would say, like, um, let, we have we're a city handed over to cars and we have we have <laughs> and, and, and uh, parking lots people think oh cars what do you mean parking lots well, as yeah, well yeah so do you so, follow strong towns i do yeah of course. so they just did this like share of like did you see the cities like from new york on of the percentage downtown dedicated to parking lots new york city is one percent atlanta is like 46 percent ouch yeah, yeah. I assume Phoenix is is in the mix. I'm with you on the uh, so cars. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Um, um, I think okay, boo. the the unofficial estimate I got from somebody who I I shouldn't You're you know okay. associate with this statistic because yeah, yeah. he just threw it out there. But I I, I believe it because I want to sort of thing. Um, but but <laughs> he, but he or she said yeah. uh, that there was at least five square miles of asphalt in Boulder, and that's twenty percent, right? Of and I, as I was saying to Query and others around the West Pearl, I wrote a letter to the editor in the Daily Camera, asphalt heat islands. You know, you want to talk about accessibility, which people are using that as a bit of a straw man. Yeah. If you're elderly or vulnerable or, you know, 100 degree days, which we're having more and more of drought, yeah. you can't do anything on asphalt. Totally. You cannot live a human life on asphalt. Yeah, that's right. Unless you, you know, Fighting well, fire I, I with mean, fire. with respect to accessibility, yeah. like as I grow old, I would like to um, <clears throat> be able to walk around my my neighborhood to get all the things that I need. When I can't walk anymore, I'd like to be able to to wheel around my neighborhood, and I don't want to be stuck in a suburb. Where... I would offer to push, help push, but I'm going to be older. <laughs> yeah. I'm older. I, I, I'm not sure that's true, but I, you know, uh... <laughs> just turned forty nine. Cool. You're you're a, you're half a year ahead of me. Hey, wow. <laughs> yeah. You're looking good. So, thank you. Oh, I <laughs> So yeah, I mean, I definitely have lots of dreams about like East Boulder and different areas of Boulder in terms of density and affordability built in, baked yeah. in. Yeah. Cuz to me, I don't know about you, but that's like a red line for me. Like if you're just building for building sake as you know with like uh highways, like talking about bikes and uh, yeah. cars. You can build five lanes, six lanes, whatever. The cars will come. Demand, if there is demand, it'll come. And if, you won't necessarily get to affordability just with de building. Right. But if you bake in, which we do, affordability, and up, up that goal, which we have, then yeah, that's I, exciting. So, but is that enough? I'm just, I'm worried. It's like too little. Yeah. So what I, what I'd love to add to our affordability program yeah. is, is, um, as we add people we remove cars and we make space for more housing. And as we do that, um, you know, if you take a, 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 a single family zoned lot and you increase its value by changing the zoning on it, then there's another opportunity for, re, you know, capturing some of the wealth that's created just by fiat, by saying your, your land, you can do more stuff with it now. And um, so, because right now what we do is we say, um, developer, if you want to build something new in one of the few places that you can still develop, we're going to um, have you tax the people that are going to buy the market rate things by making you pay us for our affordability program, which, which is fine. It doesn't help the, uh, the missing middle, perhaps. It, maybe it's, it's actually a squeeze on them. But, but this other opportunity... Well, what where, you're saying to slow down, if I yeah. understand, is we're building luxury condos, which don't help middle income affordability we are getting affordable housing funding either funding so it's or helping the units. two yep. extremes yeah um i don't think it's helping affordability enough yeah and that's not like some hippie siren call saying you know 
let's make it impossible for developers to build. But it is saying, like, do we want to be in a town where, like, half of America and the world is just run by wealthy people? Right. Uh, I don't. You know, no. I made these hats during the Trump era called Make Boulder Weird Again. <laughs> and, you know, it's not an original notion, but, you know, there's Keep Austin Weird. That ship kind of sailed a little bit. Yeah. Keep, was it Portland Weird, Seattle Weird? Maybe they've gone too weird. But, um, you know, Boulder has been a, a, a rich, culturally rich, you know, community rich town to grow up in. And I, I want to protect some of that. I think a lot yeah. of it's gone away. Yeah. Hey, well, and I think some new um, stuff has emerged too. And, and, and to your earlier point about Real resilience, um, you need you need all kinds of people to have a resilient community. You can't yeah. you can't just have people hey. in their in their armchairs writing checks for services. You know, it's like you need. Well, and that's you, what Query and like others I've met with in the restaurant industry are saying. Like, this is no surprise to anyone, but it's good to like be sympathetic. Yeah. Not to them necessarily, but to the industries that we that make our town a town yeah which is they can't hire anyone because you know i don't think we're paying enough which is a problem but yeah. their margins are tight um winnie he wants to go play with his dog <laughs> winnie it's not a charming sound dogs won't want to play with you if you just grow he's a rescue um and so there's a lot of issues with everything so we could talk for eight years but you know we just touched on minimum wage tight margins for the owners, um, can't hire people because they've all moved away for looking for affordability in homes. So, you know, single family homes, yeah, we all, we all kind of knock on them on the progressive side, but, you know, f we definitely need to build stuff that isn't just dense. It needs to be family friendly yeah. Yeah. as well. That's and true. that can look new urban, like a little common park where everyone That's can meet up. Okay, Boober. Oh, here comes another. He's waking up. Yeah. But I distracted you from, you were talking about single family. So the sort of, the game plan would be change zoning. Well, um, yeah. And, and as part of that, like, I guess, I guess the, the thing that's just, it's just a notion in my head and I, I should probably just sit and talk with an expert or, or yeah. you're kind of like, um, well, that's what we all should quit, do. quit spitballing about yeah. it. But, um, I, I feel like there's an opportunity of, are the, you know, the truth is, is that a single family home all throughout Boulder, I would say, are undervalued. And that the evidence of that is that the land is very poorly used from a kind of e economic perspective. Like, like if you could if you could actually if you were allowed to do more with that land. Yeah. The market would just go right in and, and make better use of that land. So you're saying um, it's kind of like so what, there's an sorry. well there's so there's an opportunity there as if, if you're going to make more stuff available because we have legalized ADUs. We have legalized ADUs. I wanted so, yeah, to make so, a t-shirt that said like you know legalized ADUs or something. <laughs> it would be a very bolder t-shirt. <laughs> it's like a weed uh, yeah. um, leaves With on a it or something. weed heart. <laughs> um, cuz as I said in Rockus Caucus which you were at the yeah. progressives uh, forum or debate, um, you know, in the eighties, I was living at 21st and Mapleton ramshackle, little single story Victorian, what my mom and dad bought for like nothing at the time. And, um, you know, we legalized not ADUs. What do you call them? Like backyard houses that you could actually subdivide the yard and oh, sell like, it separately. Okay. So it was even more than an ADU. Nice. Like, oh a, little, my God. like a little condoization. Hey, let's not bark, growl. That's not nice. So, and the world didn't fall apart. In fact, it helped a lot of people like pay their mortgages and you know, yeah. all that. Yeah. Um, I always think there's concerns and I try not to call everyone a NIMBY or some sort of name right off the bat unless they prove they are one, <laughs> you know? And I think there are cases where people are being NIMBY-ish, but um, yeah, are there concerns around noise? We need to make sure that's addressed. Are there concerns around trash or parking, which I think is hyped. Brian Bowen is a friend of mine and mm -hmm. he sent me a podcast on parking that despite saying podcast on parking was like the most fascinating podcast oh, yeah. you'll ever no. listen to. Uh, I love, we could talk about parking all day. Um, One of the, the bits for people out there is if we had current parking zoning apply to the Empire State Building, there'd be 63 square blocks around the Empire State Building that would be parking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's crazy. Um, yeah, so this, this brings me um, 
to a little thread we almost got started on, yeah. uh, maybe before we hit record, related to um, uh, New York City being a place where it's crazy to own a car, and yeah, not, yeah to own a car, and yep. then and then in it's Boulder, a hassle. Yeah, it's, it's a, hassle. a hassle to have a car. Yeah, and in Boulder, it's it's pretty impractical. But um, we happen to be a couple people who uh, live without cars, and it's it. I don't know how you make it work. I, I make it work. I got an e-bike and it's it's really fun. I, like I never it. had an e-bike until like a year or two ago um, and never needed it. Yeah. Having the e-bike, which I have right here, it makes it easy to pull this guy around because he's a yeah. puppy, he can't run that much. Yeah, Makes it easy to haul. I mean, honestly, I put thousands of pounds of groceries, a little bit of hyperbole on my old bikes, no problem with a couple panniers, you know? Yeah. I mean is we've done a, gr a beautiful UNESCO level job of making bike living possible as you and I, I'm sure both heartily agree. Let me jump in before you go there. If, especially if we had a beer involved, we'd say we have not improved biking infrastructure beyond hardcore cyclists. Like my next door neighbors, three kids, they would never bike around Boulder ever. They have two hulking SUVs or a truck respect not trying to diss you guys yeah <laughs> but you know it's comfortable for people like you and me who are willing to like negotiate crazy traffic and yeah. texting drivers but we need protected bike lanes absolutely is that what you're gonna say no well i was, oh. uh, I was gonna say something more general than that oh is, i thought you were gonna is, be like our no, biking no, infrastructure I, is not good i love protected bike lanes yeah. and yeah i, I definitely want to double down on more yes. and better and double um, down uh the um and, but the thing I want to point out is that if you live your life on a bike, you realize pretty quickly you are second class citizen to, to cars. Hundred percent. Right? So like, if if the, if this is what if this is the best North America can do, I'm a little depressed. Uh, this is pretty much the best we can do, <laughs> yeah. and I think we claim that five percent of people bike on a daily basis. In Amsterdam or whatever, they have rates that are 30, 50, 60, even yeah. higher percent, and they're constantly making changes every year that are huge like town squares or Pearl Street, whatever. And parking technology, you know, you need, yeah. you actually need facilities to park all the bikes that they if have. If people actually got, bike, yeah. yeah. And uh, One of my favorite issues, which will, I never convince anyone unless they know their bike stuff, which I bet you do, but no one out here will be convinced, <laughs> is a common refrain. What do we always hear when we're biking around? You probably do, yeah, you do. I don't. People say, you should wear a helmet. And I say, okay, what are you saying when you're saying I should wear a helmet? You're saying you, at some point you or one of your tribe will hit me with your huge hulking vehicle yeah. and I will be injured. My bike will probably be destroyed, but hopefully my head will make it because I'll wear a little thing of foam. Where they actually bike in the world, almost mm -hmm. no one wears helmets. Yeah. What you should be advocating for if you care about my safety is protected bike lanes. That accomplishes two things. One, it gets me out of your way. Yep. So you don't yep. have to complain about me. And number two, it takes cars off the road, which is, also makes you happy. And then number three, I live. And then people like the parents next door, the three kids will bike every day. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm, so I'm, totally, I'm totally on board with this. Um, yeah. I, I, uh, I got swayed by this um, following, uh, I think his name is Tom Flood. Mm. Uh, but but he was on the War on Cars, which is a podcast I mm -hmm. recommend to everyone. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an awesome podcast. And Strong Towns, uh, put a plug in for that, which we mentioned. Um, but he's he he's always talking about how, you know, we have we have this all this car violence, and and we're like, what we want to do is pass out orange vests, and it's like that's that's crazy, you know. It's like it's um, very blame the victim. Very, it's like, sure. hey, victim, you should be safer from me, but I'm going to keep. I'm going I'm to keep doing what I'm doing, you yeah. know, I'm, my head, my head, I'm, you know, my eyes on my phone and a yeah. two, two ton truck, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And there's so many stats. I wrote a blog called to helmet or not to helmet on elephant many years ago. I've updated it with like 8,000 studies, but there's more head injuries per user in cars than there are on bikes. Oh, I love this idea. We'll, we'll, and uh, yet no one advocates for helmet use we, in cars. We should start right here on the, on the podcast. You should right wear now. a helmet. Uh, let's, let's mandate helmets for car cars. Car there's more, I got more little factoids for you. <laughs> cars will drive three inches on average closer to you. If you're wearing a helmet. Whoa. There, there's some measurable effect of, of they feel you by far the yeah. thing that makes people safest is not helmets, but more cyclists on the road. Yeah. 
sadly helmet use particularly among women and i'm not trying to make i'm not trying to make the gendered comment this is from polls and studies do not wear want to wear helmets often yeah. you're going to work you don't want helmet head and um so that actually advocating for helmet use actually discourages people from cycling because they don't feel comfortable with the helmets and again the most the thing that makes cyclists the safest is yeah, so more cyclists kind of, on the road. kind of work against safety. So the answer is you should always advocate for helmet use for yourself, but not for others. Yeah. That's their choice and they should educate. And honestly, if I'm ever hit by a car, I hope I'm wearing a helmet. I wear it when I mountain bike, road bike, whatever. Yeah. But, yeah. and kids should. Well, so, um, anyway, something else I, I bet, get into that something one. else I bet we, uh, feel passionately in Good agreement boy. on it has to do with, uh, idling cars and yeah. oh. breathing their exhaust. I've already and done an hour of breathing and idling cars today. <laughs> Literally, it's awful. two different cafes yeah. idling for half an hour each. Uh, we have a lot of neighbors who, uh, who drive through town thinking their exhaust don't stink. Idling, for those who don't know, it's like, I think it's 30 cigarettes a minute for a small car. No one, no smoker can smoke an entire cigarette in one minute. So that's yeah. messed up. Yeah. <laughs> it's already like 60 cigarettes, it, one small car. If it's a big car, it's like 120, 150 truck. Yeah, some intuition of that, about that is if you want to kill yourself, just um, idle the car in a garage with the door shut. You know, it's like, it's really yeah. poison, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. sorry. That was <laughs> no, no, I, I mean, I say that around climate change when people are like, climate, change doesn't exist i'm like okay so you're totally cool going into a garage and firing up the car we do have we have changed tech car technology so it actually is less lethal than it used to be sure, yeah. but no one would argue that you know it, it's it's toxic yeah yeah all right well so um we we're kind of just spitballing here and uh, going from one subject to the next uh but i do think in defense of that i yeah. think a, a city is if you if you have if you're crazy or silly or stupid or whatever enough to want to serve on city council you have you have to care about all of the city and all yeah. of the people in it yeah so it does involve all issues um i don't think that means you should run around like a chicken with your head cut off like trying to handle everything i actually think city council yeah. needs to be more focused the other day they had like half an hour or 40 minutes on safety in the creek and as someone who grew up here i would say Safety in the creek is important. People don't practice safety in the creek. They don't wear shoes or helmets or whatever. But are the nine city councilors the experts who need to weigh in on that? No. Yeah. And you know, we, we can to, delegate. We need to divert that, their attention to go become experts. They're very good at becoming experts in whatever they, they need. And, oh my and God. To some extent, you know. Yeah, I was meeting with Mark Wallach and he was like, yeah, shaking his head. It was like, we don't need to be on every, every issue. Yeah. We're like micromanaging not trusting the city staff and at the same time like pretending we can be experts in half an hour on anything yeah and yeah. we need to focus on like there's some urgent issues boulder yeah. will burn down in the next 5 10 20 years unless we really take it seriously so yeah that was a uh, issue that you brought up as something you want to talk about fire mitigation so yeah. uh, can you kind of give us a the landscape of <laughs> yeah no pun, pun intended, intended. Uh, of, of, of what you're thinking about with yeah. respect to that. If we didn't have 100 plus mile per hour winds every year, we might be okay. If we didn't have a drought and climate crisis, we might be okay. Uh, we have both. Yeah. So all it takes is a spark. We have plenty of volunteers out there from cigarette smokers to cars to, you know, um, wild, you know, uh, campfires, lightning strikes. And, um, you know, I think they said with the Marshall fires, which burned a thousand homes, for those who aren't aware, thousand homes in the middle of winter, end of December, right? Yeah. It's like um, right after Christmas. A year and a half ago. December 31st or something. Anyway, dead of winter. We didn't used to have wildfires. This is nuts in the yeah. dead of winter. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, you know, I have a eight foot, seven foot wooden fence between me and my neighbors. Like, I think those need to go the way of wooden shingles on houses. It's sad, but... And there could be exceptions if it's a historic wooden fence or whatever, but we need carrots and sticks. We need people like to, we need to help people transition their wooden fences to stone or metal or stucco or whatever. Um, and we need to probably help pay some of that and educate people around it. We need crews going house to house all over any, it's not just West Boulder. You know, I've met with some firefighters on this, so I know only enough to be 
pretty much wrong on everything. Okay. But, you know, any area, like with the Marshall Fires, it could be out east where there's bordering grassland or... Yeah. So, yeah, we need to take it seriously so that we have the feeling on a 100 plus mile per hour wind night that, oh, I'm safe. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, Boulder will, I mean, look at California. It's like our minds are so, what's the word, like mammalian or something. Like we're so stuck in our present. We're like, how could this burn down? It could. Yeah. And it will. And it has. Well, we have to have a long view, right? Like it's not about yeah. whether it's going to burn down in the next 10 years or not. I mean, like, is, do we want it to be a beautiful city 100 years from now? Yeah. And so. So it's a threat we just need to handle. And I think the toxic smoke is a, a threat that hits the vulnerable first, those who have to work outside, yeah. those who don't have, you know, five air purifiers and swamp coolers or whatever from McGuckin. Hopefully they're shopping local. Yeah. Uh, you know, we need, we need to address climate crisis in, in every way, uh, from water to, I mean, some on the plan side of things, I think, make a good point. Like, what can Boulder handle in terms of our water? Um, we do need to have enough water. We need to be more efficient and thoughtful. How many times do you see sprinklers in the middle of the day or whatever? Yeah. Well, I heard a, a water expert uh, testify at the at the Capitol when the SB 213 was was uh, being the considered. beloved 213. Rest in peace. Uh, <laughs> I just saw Jared this morning. It probably not. It probably won't rest in peace. Yeah. <laughs> honestly, um, no. Uh, I just saw Jared this morning at brunch. Oh, he cool. was just walking by with nice. Marlon. Um, yeah. Uh, that bill was uni- universally beloved by all. It was received with open yeah. arms. Well, anyways, he, this, this water expert was saying that, um, you know, a lot of the arguments that you hear about oh my God. people and water consumption are, un- are, you can actually have more density yep. and l- use less water because- I'm not of, arguing uh, because of that. Of the, because of the issue with But I think you have to address yeah. it responsibly. That's right. That's right. Because water use is- corrupt, inefficient, you know, we're just so, it's just a resource we're just happy to waste. We have it literally purified water, as you know, in our toilets, like. Yeah, yeah, drinking water from our grass. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. So yeah, um, where were we? Housing? I don't know. Um, Yeah, housing and water. Oh, uh, you were talking about fire. Fire mitigation, yeah. Yeah. You were talking about it. I don't, I don't actually know much much about it. it. hasn't. That's the first, I think it's the first time it's come up on the podcast. About- I think, you know, siding of houses, roofs, uh-huh. roof, roofing is a huge thing for climate crisis. And, you know, asphalt roofs have a lot of toxic materials in them that shed over time. Yeah. Um, especially with hail and stuff. Um, I got a white metal roof and my attic with good insulation, a white metal roof is cool 360 days a year. Nice. There's five days a year where it's like warm, but it never gets hot. People literally go into my attic and are like, Wait, what? what? Yeah. Interesting. So, you and know, we can more, do a lot I, of cool I assume stuff. That's, that's more expensive, but it's, I, I also assume it, it lasts. Double the price. It, it lasts twice as long, at least. It lasts like 100 years. Yeah, right. If it's installed correctly, which mine was pretty good, but. Okay. Yeah, I mean, white metal roofs should be a thing, you know. Whatever, whatever. There's always experts on everything, and I think that's something I'll always say, which doesn't do my ego any good, but there are a lot of people smarter and more knowledgeable than me on almost every issue. And I, yeah. part of my approach is to like bring those people in and, and respect them and not try to reinvent the wheel because I'm such a genius yeah. on everything like yeah. Elon Musk style. Right. Where right. I think I'm like God's gift. Yeah, I, to, would not, I would not vote for Elon Musk for city council. I wouldn't vote for him on <laughs> dog catcher. <laughs> yeah. Where do you want to go next? Um, I mean, you brought up housing. We touched on that. I think, yeah. you know, I'd love to learn more from you on your thoughts with zoning and density, particularly, particularly around affordability, because I don't really give a crap about Boulder getting bigger and denser. I do give a crap about Boulder um, becoming more accessible and yeah. equitable. And if that means denser, which it does, th- great. But like, I think too often the density, density is such a generic, can mean anything to anyone. Like developers love it and activists love it. I think you should be (laughs) cynical about a word that can be supported by those two groups. That's right. Um, Well, of course, I mean, um, developers are going to respond to and do whatever they can to make money in the city. And we certainly don't want to just be handing over 
our our city's character to developers to say, hey, come in and build whatever you want to build. Well, and I also know? think developers is a word that's too generic. There's some yeah, great right. developers that's in right. town who have a history and who care about Boulder, and there's some who are just basically lying, open face lying to the to the council about what they'll do affordability wise. Yeah. Well, so my my thing about housing is that it just sits at the convergence of so many issues related to climate change, resilience, yeah. affordability, um, beauty. Mm -hmm. um, like I want to live in a beautiful neighborhood and mm -hmm. I want it to be highly socially connected. I want to walk out my door and uh, run into people and have conversation and, and find out about live entertainment that I didn't know before I walked yeah. out the door. Yeah. And um, that's the kind of holiday neighborhood you're describing. Yeah. They have a movie in the park. You're like, what? Hey, you know, cool. you walk out, people are like, oh, did you know Lucinda's having a yard sale, you know? And now you can buy that thing for 20 bucks that you were going to go buy new made in China, shipped overseas, you know, for 150 bucks. Yeah. Like that's community. That, definitely. So, yeah, I, I want to see, um, I want to see us give up cars and I want to, so like, I'm not worried about more people in my neighborhood. Yeah. I'm worried about more cars in my neighborhood. Yeah. And I'm worried about all the, the asphalt being packed with more cars. And I, I would love to figure out how to crack this nut of how do we go from suburban style sprawl to really cool, compact development that's car light and walkable. Yeah. And Well, and, there's, um, I think transportation and housing are kind of the same thing. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think there's this like truism I read recently or heard in a podcast or something um, that was like people actually aren't attached to their cars. That's sort of a myth. People are attached to whatever's convenient and affordable. Yeah. So if they can, like in Paris, I think, did I mention Mayor Hidalgo in the- Not yet. But in the Rockets Caucus? Oh, Winnie, you're uh, not being a good teammate right now. <laughs> so Mayor Hidalgo, this kick-ass like feminist mayor in, in Paris, which is a big car city mm -hmm. historically, recent history, um, said, we're gonna expand bike lanes and blah, 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 blah. So she went in and, individual car ownership in five years you can look it up new york times article etc widespread coverage went from 85 percent to like 35 percent or something like that okay radical change in five years that is people and i've spent a fair amount of time in paris over the last few years because it was the first time in my life i could afford to travel and i'm a writer and you know the romance of paris come on yeah all my parisian friends are like don't have cars are like, let's hop on a, what, what do you call them? The Vélibs or whatever. You're not going to use a fake French accent. To, no. To, they're, like, to quote <laughs> they're like, <laughs> so, you know, we hop on these bikes, the public bikes that are mm -hmm. half of them are trashed, half aren't. Yeah. They're abused. But, um, and we are zooming all the way across Paris, which is not Boulder. It's a big city yep. in like literally 30 minutes of joy and they're electric, yep. you know, so Fun. very accessible for most folks. And then they have amazing, you know, I wanted to call it a T because I lived in Boston, but subway and other stuff. Well, and um, I, one of the, one of the, someone that I've, I've been in touch with a few times that they, they cry ableist, you know, you yeah. just, all you care about is well, people they who, should. who I can, mean, it needs but, to be but comprehensive. I, but I, yeah. But I would say that um, the people who need to drive, the more people that yeah. get out, out of their cars yeah. and, and leave the streets available for the people who need to drive, it makes it so much better for the drivers. Yeah. And so it's not a zero sum, like we're just taking cars away and making everybody like suffer. It's also like, it's, we're not at that point where we're like, um, you know, we're not banning cars. We're in a car culture. We're talking about yeah. moving from here to there. Yeah. No pun intended on transportation totally. and saying my point with the bikes in Paris was, people actually want to get across town in the quickest, easiest, most fun, most yeah. affordable, yeah. and including their ability or, or differing ability way. And if you make it easier with a subway or a bus that's regular, or, you know, like the hop is amazing, the electric particularly, yeah. and you know, that thing should be staffed up and running every five seconds as far as I'm and concerned, add, and it should some, be free add some, ideally. Add some new routes. Yeah. And make it free or have, you know, expand the eco pass or do something magic like mayor, the mayor in Boston. I forget her name. Anyway, oh, she's yeah. amazing. Um, Wu? Yeah, I think so. I don't, I don't remember. Haven't been back to Boston for a few years, but, um, yeah, it's, you know, we're not, we're not getting in the way of anyone getting from here to there. We're just saying maybe you don't need like a four ton truck with the macho wheels and the truck nuts to, you know, drive downtown. 
to West End. So you mentioned Plan Boulder. Um, I don't really. I apologize. No, that's okay. I, I'm I, kidding. Um, that was humor. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, uh, I, uh, I actually don't know how you affiliate in terms of, and I don't even know what the group, the, what the groups are called anymore. Like, um, but, yeah. but uh, Winnie, watch out. I guess I don't even know where the question's going. I'm sorry. Um, you're not a Plan Boulder type uh, who's going to be endorsed by them. I mean, or as I said to the Boulder Progressives, I wanted their endorsement. Mm -hmm. I said, I want everyone's endorsement. This yeah. is democracy. Last yeah. I checked, you want votes. <laughs> right. You want support. Right. So is Plan Boulder offering me their endorsement? No. Am yeah. I on their slate? No. If they said, we will support you, Waylon, I'd be like, heck yes. Yeah. If they said, we will support you only if you sign a litmus test, which everyone tries to get you to do, basically, yeah. to always, you know, observe fealty or whatever and 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 be prostrate myself no yeah i'm running as an independent and that's sort of my fourth major issue which is i actually you know i think with my roots here hopefully in my my um just having roots and friendship and and some folks knowing me hopefully i can win without pledging fealty to one slate or another i do want the support of any slate who will support me yeah I'm not being duplicitous here. Plan ha isn't really talking to me. I don't expect their support, but I would love it. Yeah. Same with progressives. I just sat down with them. I wanted their support. And they were like, well, we like you overall, but this was in the follow-up phone call with Eric, but, but, you know, and we hope to work with you if you win, but um, you're not like a square peg in a square hole for us. Um, I think I was like probably one of the, next like if they had more picks i might have won but i wasn't one of their top whatever it is for right yeah they've got to they've got to winnow it down to a, a slate that's the right size and that's fine with me because i think yeah. part of the sickness in boulder is like with the homeless public safety issue which is the same issue basically mm -hmm. is everyone's so busy yelling at each other and very few people to solve something hard and by solving i don't mean make it perfect or go away entirely but like actually help yeah. You need execution. You need cooperation. If you read about what homeless, hom what Houston did with its homelessness, and I'm not saying Houston is the same as Boulder, but they solved homelessness by 65%. They literally said that our magic sauce was we got all the nonprofits and the government and the groups to talk to each other. That was the only magic we had. And I think that's, we need uh, more of that. there's some truth in that, right? There's like, and I think um, I can bring that in a way people on one slate or the other can't. Yeah, sorry. that's great. Oh, appreciate that. But sorry. Right. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think, um, I don't know enough about how all the different homeless services work in Boulder, but I do have some intuition that um, better coordination and better just um, understanding this is what we do and this is what you do and that doesn't make us against each other. Um, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, I think everyone hopefully is sort of aligned on a basic, on a basic level. If you like took everyone up in the, you know, to Gold Hill and to do ayahuasca one night, like everyone <laughs> in, in who's concerned about public safety and homelessness. Um, hey, everyone, can, maybe instead of everybody, just take your eight colleagues on city council. And, yeah, uh, <laughs> but I mean, we also need public support for it and, and city support because it's, it's coordination. Um, you know, everyone would say, look, okay, if public safety is my thing and I like to call homeless people transients or vagrants and I'm like angry at them and I don't want to spend any tax dollars, well, then you're probably aligned on, you don't want to throw millions of dollars more at the police while simultaneously tying the police hands and saying, all you can do is move them around. You're not solving anything. You're just spending more money making the homeless lives worse. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and the police force, yeah, there's always going to be room for improvement um, and, and what do you call it? Like uh, supervision. Yeah. Um, oversight. Oversight. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. We should have an oversight committee. That would be non-controversial <laughs> in Boulder. Um, wink for the wink, podcasters yeah. out there. But, um, you know, we could actually take all those millions of dollars where Bob Yates and some others want to throw at the police and after already throwing more and say, let's, I think the shelter is a good start. I think the shelter should be located near the night shelter, not far away from it. Um, I think, uh, you know, we need transitional housing like many all over the U.S. are talking about. Because basically, if you're going to pay the police to do a thankless job, 
to, in many cases, ruin already tenuous yeah, lives. Yeah, right. You're just paying to move them and make their lives worse, which is not good for anyone. When your life is worse, you become more desperate, mental health-wise, daily safety-wise. So we need transitional housing where all the services can go. And it does need to be in a safe location that hopefully is safe so for the neighbors. everything you've said yeah. to me sounds like uh, something that Boulder progressives would agree with. Was this an issue that there was that there was? I'm a, just super this, passionate about it, and oh, to yeah. me, it's emblematic of the two sides. Or there's 18 different sides, but the two yeah. sides can't talk to each other about it. Yeah. Therefore, we don't make progress on it unless you win. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. The only way we can make progress in Boulder, and I'm not meaning that in the progressive sense, just progress on any. Subject. problem or, yeah. or hope it could be a unesco positive thing or it could be a negative problem thing yeah um the only way we're making progress is by winning five to three in council or you know five to four or whatever and but we should be able to actually come together and say look public safety is intimately related to homelessness and all public safety concerns are not illegitimate yeah there are legitimate public safety concerns right. also for the homeless population totally like 75% of homeless women, I read a stat, get sexually assaulted at some point. Like it's not, the status quo is not good for anyone. Yeah, yeah. And that's where I was saying the ayahuasca thing. Like on a fundamental level, I think people can agree actually. Like, oh, we can address public safety by actually giving the homeless folks who want it a place to go that's safe and independent. Get them some services to help them out with mental health sandwiches, you know, um, their own safety um, and then hopefully transition them to job, jobs and housing. Yeah, yeah. And that's like, then you're helping people's lives. That's a pretty good thing. That's why I supported attention homes. Like that's awesome. together. Yeah. That's like the best thing in the world if you can help someone's life. Absolutely. Yeah, this came up in the last interview with Nicole Spear mm. of the, of, you know, the number one predictor of adult homelessness is childhood homelessness so giving these teens mm. a, 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 an anchor you know and, mm. and a place to live it's 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 trajectory changing for them a hundred percent yeah well I, I um thanks for tackling that subject um it's um it's definitely a polarizing one and I actually everything you said makes sense and and honestly like I talk to lots of people about this subject, and for me, I don't feel like I'm an expert, and I'm still trying to wrap my head on it around it. Um, lots of things that people say on this subject make sense to me, and um, uh, why there's a lot of yelling and division about it. That also makes sense to me, I guess, because it's it's like such an emotional. We all have the emotional response to uh, seeing encampments or you yeah, know, whatnot. Um, well, and we but, should. I mean, I've biked home, as I'm sure you have, on wintry nights, seeing homeless folks settling in for the night. And you're like, it is freezing and, and windy. And like, if you're not yeah. having an emotional response to that, something's wrong. That's right. But at the same time, if you then say, you know, homelessness is a right, that's correct on a philosophical level, but on a reality level, like, homelessness is not safe for the homeless, and it's not... It's a, it's a symptom often that something is off with your community if you're tolerating um, that level of inequity and lack of safety even for the homeless population. Yeah. And I think, you know, this isn't an issue where I have opinions. This is an issue where I've studied a fair amount. I've worked okay. on a little and I've met with a tons, of, tons of people. And I think, to me, it's not an issue of public safety or homelessness. It's an issue of working together as a city and a public and Okay, so to that, accomplish that, some solutions. Yeah, that's great. So you, you actually did a really nice job of describing some of the problems. What what are you, like your top three, four things of how to solve this issue or or uh, make progress on it? On homelessness? Yeah. Well, the transitional housing. Yeah. Number one. Okay. I think the day shelter is a improvement. I don't think the location is right um, because it's so far. Like you wake up in way north Boulder. Yeah. All of your salute, all of your uh, worldly possessions are what in a couple backpacks, whatever. Mm -hmm. You can't even have your dog, so the shelter doesn't work for everyone. The shelter is wonderful, but then you have to go all the way to downtown Boulder for the day shelter, which is down here, and then you have to go all the way back. 
That to me, I don't understand that. Yeah, I guess. I don't get um, it. The, 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 my pushback to that, and I don't know what people, I'm sure think. Well, how are you getting think, there? Well, the, the, I would say, for starters, that the, 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 the problem seems flipped to me. Like, the, the shelter is in way north Boulder. Sure. And the, the challenge that anyone homeless has yeah. is they got to they got to find their way up there. Oh, I'm not debating that. Yeah. I'm just saying so them like, in wildly I mean, they're, they're, different locations is not practical. I see, because it, 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 it just it just increases the burden for them for moving around. Yeah, it makes your day uh, on a on a hundred degree day or a, a freezing cold winter day. How do you make that work? I, yeah. It's tough. I mean, obviously taking the bus if you can, but. Anyway, I do think, you know, transitional tents, villages or tiny house village. Sanctioned camping yeah. would, be, would be good or no? Yeah, yes. that, yeah. that's sort of the same thing um, yeah. where you make it safe. You bring all the services there. People can't have their dogs. Um, you provide the tents so they're winterproof. Yeah. They're not like these, some of these flimsy tents. Um, you have heaters that aren't flammable so you don't have the danger of fire. Yeah. killing people yeah, right. or lighting boulder on fire. Um, you know, I think that's kind of magic. I mean, there's always going to be criticism of everything, but, um, you know, as FDR said way back, like try something, try anything, just try, just try yeah. to help. Yeah. And, you know, you learn from all the other cities what they've done. Yeah. Pay, keep your eyes open. And don't have too broad, yeah. broad a brush. Like that's you right. can say, Oh, Portland, Seattle, they're failures. But within that failure, they've tried some things that have worked. That's right. Well, I like that. I like that approach. Yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing that. And that way um, you don't have to, you can literally leave your stuff during the day. You're not traveling around all the time. If you have an, a, a sanctioned campground, yeah, yeah, you can kind of, yeah. Yeah. Um, keep, keep track of your things. And you know, my argument to the like, there's a lot of people we might call the NIMBYs or the Plan Boulder or whatever who are like, we don't want to pay for that crap. Again, even from the police's point of view, this is safer for everyone. It, it, you know, I said to Dave Query, like, imagine, imagine if there were 65% fewer homeless folks trying to live downtown or on the creek. That's good even from the opposite point of view. Yeah. And it's less expensive. And that money is being spent on compassion, not on this sort of confused enforcement because right. we've honestly like we put the police in a weird position where we want to throw money at them but we also don't want them to enforce a camping ban and they're dealing with mental health you know it's kind of the worst of all yeah, worlds and the, and, yeah. yeah and the defund the police movement had a few things right which is like mental health should be handled by mental health professionals maybe with safety of police accompanying them but you know, the police shouldn't have to handle everything and probably aren't equipped to handle everything from their own point of view. I think our problems are manageable in practice, but if people don't want to work together, it won't happen. And I think that's what I'm offering. That's my hope. And I don't think it's naive entirely. I'm sure I'll be, I'm sure I'll be discouraged at various points. Yeah, but I think working together isn't, I always say it's not like a kumbaya thing. We don't all have to hug and do ayahuasca and gold hill we need to actually like sit down and say how can we help what are your constructive ideas i'll take those and then we'll put them all together and we'll figure out something that helps and if that doesn't work we'll keep what did work and and try again how do you feel about new neighborhoods at like the planning reserve or the airport uh love it yeah cool i don't love like <laughs> i do think you know building on open space kind of things I don't love that. Open space is dedicated as open space. It's part of the magic of Boulder. But planning reserve, you know, I will make a, some friends when I say, like, where I was born, the hospital, I wish, I do wish there was more affordability on it. Mm -hmm. I, you know. At the, at the Aspen Alpine, Alpine Balsam. Balsam. Yeah. And that's been a non controversial issue everyone agrees on 100% from the beginning. But no, I'm, you know, obviously kidding. Like, you know, that is a place where if you could have a bunch of folks living and, and you still make it livable and nice for the neighbors and beautiful and yeah. some office space and retail and, you know, we can do cool things. We actually can. Absolutely. And I think, you know, when we just yell at each other, we kind of we reduce all the cool, fun things it also, down to like <laughs> the little bit that survives. I mean, one of the ironies is that the property as it is 
looks like a war zone. And so in the years that we've spent yeah. trying to debate what is going to happen, people yeah. have had to just spend time living next to this yeah. bomb asbestos, bomb shelled out. Asbestos, yeah. asbestos, like bomb And, and bomb that's, that's part, of, that's part yeah. of who we are, too, is like, what, what, what are we living with right now? And, you know, so all the yelling is kind of like, I feel like prolonged what the cool stuff that could have been built there. But, but I mean, my goal, I think, is like a Boulder boy who grew up here, you know, one of my best friends, Noah and Yeshe, lived on North Boulder Park in a little ranch house that probably costs like 30,000 bucks. Mm -hmm. Nobody can tell me about neighborhood character. Like I grew up here. So the people saying, oh, if you have too much density for affordable housing, you're changing the neighborhood character. I'd be like, no, I'm, where do you live? Oh, you live in a, and again, this isn't going to make me a lot of friends, but you live in a McMansion on North Boulder Park that was built in the last 15 years. It's millions of dollars. You change the neighborhood character. Yeah. We want a mix of affordability. And by that, I include middle income affordability. And, you know, yeah, some nice fancy homes and apartments. And, you know, that's the neighborhood character around North Boulder Park historically. Yeah. It yeah. wasn't big fancy homes. Yeah. And the, the zoning actually um, uh, on North Street, just, just to the south of the park, yeah. is. Uh, is actually quite dense. Uh, mm. What's possible there? There's a lot of uh, quadplexes and duplexes and um, yeah. People have this weird, like dystopian picture of like every quadplex is going to be like eighteen frat boys throwing their keg <laughs> through <laughs> totally. my window. Yeah. And you know we do address <clears throat> noise complaints. We do need to make sure people feel safe and have quality of life. I I that's where I push back on progressives on Twitter sometimes saying like oh, all these objections are NIMBYs, you know? It's like, yeah, you know, I live on the hill. I deal with crazy parties. Yeah. I can tell you stories, mm -hmm. you know, of like parties that are out of control, not cool. But we have, I can call the noise complaint, you know, the police, you know, I, the main thing I try to do is meet all my neighbors and get their numbers so I can text them and be like, hey, and 99% of the time they're cool. But if you're a little, little old person, I get that you might not feel safe you doing might, that. You might not, yeah, you might not want to walk into their house and right. say, hey, introduce, m and I'd like to introduce myself. But I do yeah. have to give these like crazy college kids some credit. Over the years, they have been so respectful and nice, not just to me, but to all the neighbors who are of different ages and sizes and genders. And so by, and during the flood, you know, the frat boys and all were walking up and down university with like 18 shovels helping out. Nice. Like there's some good heartedness. Well, that makes me want to ask you about occupancy and how you yeah. feel like um, if it's going to ruin the hill and if uh, yeah, what what your stance is on like yeah. Uh, well, Can I have I, a yes no paddle on this? I'm kidding. What I hate the yes no <laughs> bullshit. I, I just really want everyone out there. If you're a Boulder voter, if anyone ever says yes or no on anything and doesn't add <laughs> any some kind nuance, of yeah. nuance or context or, <clears throat> or thoughtfulness around it never vote for them because they're just going for popularity. Yeah, um, checking boxes. Occupancy, my, my main answer is, yeah. Back in the 50s, I think we had like a limit of six per household. Now we're at three, Yeah. And, uh, unrelated. And, and four in a lot of neighborhoods. Okay, three and four. So yeah, my basic answer is yes, but there are devils in the details. And if you just say, hey, you know, landlords, I mean, who here like loves the absentee landlords of like the College Hill? Nobody. But if you say to them, oh, you can make more units per building. Are they going to are they going to do affordability with that lower prices or are they going to maximize, you know, what they so can that, make? That's what I've um, so always, we just need to I, make sure. So, so you're an expert on the Hill. So this, maybe you can answer this question that the, 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 my response has always been. Are there really a lot of empty bedrooms? Like I, I, I've always, I've always assumed that the hill, and Martin Acres, like what I hear from people that are worried about occupancy, is they're like, these neighborhoods are over occupied, not, not like oh, there's a ton of empty bedrooms that are going to suddenly be filled when occupancy mm. restrictions go down. So do you have a sense that like, I do, occupancy will actually go up? Uh, I think it'll those, go up a little bit because I do think, you're basically right with your question, which is like it's sort of like pot, like everyone's already smoking pot, even if it's not legal, that's back in the day. <laughs> like people are already putting six people in a house illegally in quotes, even though it, we don't have those that permitted. But 
making it safe and legal is important because you need fire exits and you need to drive True. for affordability. Yeah. And like next in the house next to me, not to call out the management company or the landlords or whatever, but um, management company, I don't mind calling them out. <laughs> Boulder property. Um, they're sp still spraying with Roundup, which supposedly is illegal. Oh, gross. Um, but yeah, I mean, they've gone nuts on occupancy many years. And I've been in that house a few times. They had like a sheet hanging on a line in the basement with like one point of egress in the basement. I swear to God, there's black mold in there. Like it is gross and wow. wet and cold down there. So yeah, that didn't feel safe for them. Cause what if there's a fire and they're stuck down there? Like we're responsible as a city for yeah. not thinking about that. But again, that feels like um, these are all problems that have occurred while occupancy yeah. ordinances have been in place. No, I'm supportive of expanding and, yeah. occupancy if we can make sure that it's not just like a win, a financial windfall for crappy landlords. If if we yeah. can incentivize landlords and good landlords, particularly to build more units and so I use, and I, okay, get prices so, down so just, a little. Just to pin you down just a little bit. Yeah. Are you kind of against the ordinance that's going to be considered next month? We're, we're filming this on uh, July 30th, I think. What's, what's the ordinance say ne for next month? Um, it's voting on expanding it to four or five. Um, they're, they're probably going to go to five. Unrelated. But what are, the, what are the safety measures for making sure that it's not just a development, you know, financial windfall for landlords? Is there anything in there that would bake in, oh, this $2,500 house or whatever, $5,000 house, the every rental will go down $100. There's nothing in there about that. I don't nothing. Think so. so why would that be good for rent prices? It wouldn't be. It would be good for density, but but only a little bit to your point that people are already occupying. Yeah, I guess, I guess one thing I would say to that is, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a rabbit hole, but I opened it, right? So um, the... Um, a scenario that I've heard brought up many times is you have a house that has uh, five bedrooms. This, this is kind of a fictional house, and I'm not. I'd, I'd like to know if they exist, honestly. Um, a five-bedroom house that you can rent to three people for three thousand dollars, and then if you change it to five unrelated people, now you can relate it. You can rent it to five people for five thousand dollars, and that's somehow a worst-case scenario because the landlord is just getting a free money and. There's no affordability clause. And, and my, my, I have two kind of responses to that. One is like, you're kind of forgetting that two people are gonna have affordable housing that didn't have it before. So you're arguing with yourself a little bit though, cause just a minute ago you said- Because per person, per person- Those the, the, people the are already rent, occupying those houses at five. Well, right, I, I actually can't believe it's kind of a fictional yeah. scenario in the first place. So to me, it's kind of like, that, that's my other response is like, um, and this connects with the parking too. If you could, if you could, uh, you know, not expand parking for to five people yeah, or totally. whatever, yeah, and somehow have better public transportation infrastructure, because parking is one of the issues that the sort of the NIMBY side of the fence will bring up. They say, oh, there's going to be two more like Wranglers. Let's admit it. Yeah, <laughs> or huge SUVs. Yeah, right. Um, in the in the alley. I mean. None of this is easy. I think probably on a, on a, the specific bill going forward, I, I don't know enough yeah, of the details, okay. but my assumption, it's I would say I would support it yeah. if there's any countermeasures in there around parking, um, around, you know, encouraging biking or whatever, uh, you know, e-bike subsidies, none of that exists for the students. And, and um, if there's something to discourage the landlord from just raising the prices on everyone, which they will do without any. So I don't think that bill sounds super sexy to me. Okay. Would I vote for it? Probably. Does it sound like a when? Not really. I mean, you know, the sausage is made like in politics, you're not going to get perfect bills. Yeah. Do I think yeah. occupancy limits raising them is important just because people could be burned alive in a basement? I do. Yeah. But do I think it's going to help affordability? Not without the countermeasures. And those countermeasures, I've talked with some experts about it. I'm not an expert. Yeah. But like, how do well, you how um, do you incentivize <clears throat> landlords to keep the prices down? That's important. Yeah. How do you handle all those Wranglers and SUVs? That's important. Yeah, I had, I I became aware of a landlord recently who had 
uh, rented their house out to uh, some students and it got completely trashed. Yeah. And um, he, he has a serious incentive now to find someone, that, you know, renters that look more like a traditional family, perhaps. You yeah, know, or, just, or some, just older. Or just older, right, yeah. you know. And so, um, uh, yeah, I guess there's different kinds of landlords and the absentee ones that have just always um, catered to college kids um, are going to be different than this guy who owns this property that's yeah. his only rental, you know. My dream um, would be to do something on the absentee landlords and the property management companies because they have no investment in this community. Yeah, They trash those houses every semester. The, la the landscaping companies that are hired to come in trash the yards. They're literally cutting down a 100-year-old lilac bush. I ran out to stop it. I sent the photos to the landlords who I happen to know. They live in California. They're Apple investors. They're like, oh, why are they cutting down our lilac bush? But they don't care. Yeah. And, it, you know, they get back to me a week or two later. And the lilac bush is gone? Or did, huh? you, st did you stop it? Or I stopped you, half yeah, of it. Half of it. I literally heard this. And I was like, what are they cutting that would make that sound? And I went outside just because I'm, you know, I've become a paranoid, <laughs> you know, living next to a yeah. call. It's like literally like anything that's not bolted down will get destroyed. Yeah. And that includes trees. You used to have all these rose bushes on the west side. They're all cut down by wow. weed whacker. They cut, they weed whack the rose bushes down. Like they have no <laughs> commitment to yeah. Boulder at yeah. all. Yeah. And that includes Boulder property management and their friends. <laughs> this, you know, I've, I've often joked that, you know, when you, when you spray Roundup to kill off the dandelions, it's the, it's the war on flowers. Yeah. But I've never heard the war on flowers go to the level where we're just going to literally like cut down rose bushes. Well, these landscaping companies, they're like given simple instruction, like cut, just yeah. make everything look neat. Or, yeah. I don't know what their instruction is. Yeah. I literally talk to these guys. I don't vilify them either. Yeah. I'm like, oh, could you not spray the roundup because the puppy and the baby and blah, and the landlord actually doesn't <laughs> want it, which is true. And they do it anyway, or they stop, but they do it anyway. So, well, I want to say thank you to the listeners for uh, listening to our, our ramblings here in the in the in the it was cemetery. Very, a lot it's, of rambling, uh, <laughs> but I am Waylon. You know, Waylon Jennings was the rambling man. Uh huh. So nice. Yeah, that was a lot of rambling, but hopefully. No, I really, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Yeah. I'm I'm happy to keep going too. Like I'm, I, if there's a, if you have another subject you want to dive into, I want want to be respectful of your time as well. Um, yeah. Is, is, is there anything else you'd like to kind of touch on or, or dive into? Or do you have a, do you have a, uh, give you an opportunity for a parting shot? Um, I think we're pretty good. I mean, I feel like, you know, the other thing I maybe bring to the table that others don't is the sort of public facing reputation or personality or, or being that I am. And I hopefully can expand the voting pool and, you know, I'm always a little discouraged. Like Boulder has this amazing group of people on all sides who are obsessed about the politics in this town, yeah. as you know. Yeah. But then outside of that, like 99% of my friends are like, wait, how many people are in council? Yeah. Wait, you're running for which? <laughs> what are you doing? How long is it? You know, people aren't involved. And I really, I think, you know, Bob Yates with his newsletter, like there's some signs that are healthy. Obviously you can criticize that newsletter for whatever, um, but you know, we need more public engagement, especially in the absence of the Daily Camera being a strong paper. And I think Boulder Reporting Lab is amazing and Shea does amazing work, but yep. Boulder Beat, but we need more involvement, not less. And I hope to bring that. Gonna find me a residential pedestrian district where I can gracefully grow older. Gonna spend my remaining years Sharing Boulder. Thank you for listening to Sharing Boulder. Please support the podcast by sharing it with your friends and neighbors. You can contact me at linktree.com slash philipogren, which you can find by duck, duck going linktree Philip Ogren, or by visiting sharingboulder.us, where you can also find show notes and previous episodes. This episode of Sharing Boulder was produced by Philip Ogren, and the music was created by Nathaniel Ogren and Sack Lunch. Keep sharing, Boulder. <laughs>